dear friends, we gather this morning to remember and to celebrate the life of one who filled our world with her intelligence, her goodness, her spirit, and her example. In humility and gratitude, we turn to the wisdom of our tradition for comfort, for guidance, and for understanding. Throughout the centuries, whenever our people felt lost, adrift, confused, bereaved, they would turn to the words of Psalms for comfort and for solace. One of the favorites was Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from Adonai, maker of heaven and of earth. <laughs> who do not take bribes. Those who live in this way shall never be shaken. For those of you for whom the 23rd Psalm is familiar, I invite you to join with me in its recitation. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fall. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I die, remember me with a smile and laughter. If thoughts of me provoke no love, only sadness and tears, I ask that I be soon forgotten. Give what's left of me away to old ones who wait to die. 
And if you must cry, cry for your brother or sister who walks in grief beside you. And when you need meat, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give to me. I want to leave you something, something better than words or sounds. Look for me in the people I've known or loved or helped in some special way. And if you cannot give me away, let me live in your eyes for a while as well as in your mind. You can love me most by letting love live within the circle of your arms, embracing the frightened ones. Love doesn't die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. My dear Robert, Laura, and Dan, Stephen, and Helen, Jeffrey, dear family, dear, fam dear, dear friends, as we join together at this sad time, I cannot help but imagine Gloria hovering at the edges of our gathering. That's important. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I cannot help but imagine Gloria hovering at the edges of our gathering with pen and notepad in hand, sensing a human interest story about to unfold and ready to record the who, what, when, where, and why of its trajectory. We are not so talented, but we know that hers is a good story, a previously undocumented story, as she was always interested in others, never herself. So with apologies in advance to Gloria for the amateurish recounting of the life of a real professional, we lovingly, admiringly, appreciatively, and gratefully invoke her memory and the story she shared with us for 94 and a half years. Gloria arrived in Cleveland on December 11, 1928, the firstborn child of Eastern European immigrant Louis Levine and first-generation American, Marion. Younger sister Rita, with whom Gloria enjoyed a lifelong closeness, completed their immediate family. But with Marion's nine brothers and sisters, Gloria and Rita grew up surrounded by a rogues gallery of aunts, uncles, and cousins, activities, family gatherings, outings, colorful characters, high-spirited antics, and conversations in an environment of warmth and security with an upwardly mobile energy and an unfailing sense of possibility. To make her life even more colorful, Gloria's father, Louis, was a cigar-smoking, outgoing, sociable, gregarious individual whom everyone loved. Her five-foot mother was a wonderful woman in her own right, if not quite the personality. The influences were many, deep, rich, and varied. For her part, Gloria remembered with great fondness summers punctuated with trips to Madison, Ohio, where an aunt and uncle had a cabin, and a weekend visit meant lazy days of swimming, watching the trains go by, playing outside for hours, and enjoying family meals. Gloria had many fond memories of growing up in Cleveland Heights on Sycamore. She spoke, she spoke often of skating parties, of going to weddings to meet boys, of joining her high school sorority and developing friendships there that lasted the rest of her life, as did many of the friendships from Boulevard Elementary and Roosevelt Jun Junior High, as well as Floristone Mather College. From her earliest days, Gloria was active and involved, pursuing her passions and standing up for what she believed. She was a voracious reader 
and throughout her life was never without a book in her hand or with an easy access. She was also a talented writer from a young age who wrote for the Heights High newspaper and was co-editor of the high school yearbook. She loved English and European history and was especially well-versed in British and European royalty. As son-in-law Dan, I believe it was Dan said, observed, but correct me if I'm wrong, you couldn't get a king or queen by her. <laughs> that was you, okay, true. and it was true. As she loved to read, she loved to do research. And before the days of online access and Google, she was often happily at the library for hours at a time. The American Civil War was another great interest of hers, as was Jewish history. There was something gutsy and even scrappy about Gloria, not outwardly so much. She was always well-mannered, well-spoken, and polite, but in an but in an era when women's lives were still fairly circumscribed and limited, Gloria did not hide how smart she was. She was forthright about her interest in history. She pursued her education with seriousness and focus. And when she entered the workforce, she would not be anyone's girl or gopher, insisting on one famous incident that she was not a waitress. While there is no question in my mind that she was a feminist, in the early days of feminist consciousness raising, when the principles and beliefs concerning women's rights were often harshly stated or even exaggerated, Gloria chose not to go to a feminist rally because she, because she claimed she would always serve her husband dinner. She wasn't shy and she wasn't retiring. She had a healthy sense of who she was and what she could accomplish. When her children were little, Gloria volunteered for the PTA in our sisterhood at Fairmont Temple for pioneer women that later became known as Naamat, an Israel-focused organization dedicated to serving women and children. Gloria was also involved in the National Council of Jewish Women and Hadassah. She was a passionate Zionist. With Bob, a longtime devoted member of our congregation and an activist in our community. She was the proud owner of the Euclid Avenue Temple cookbook, autographed by Rabbi Brickner and still used for some of its recipes. When Steve was in fourth grade, Gloria went back to work. She was a composition aide a newly created position in the Heights school system in which she served as a kind of assistant teacher to encourage the students in their writing with suggestions and guidance as to how they might improve. She graded a lot of papers in that position and a lot of them were papers on Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. She served as the secretary to the vice president of our Jewish Federation. It was when she started moving into the field of public relations and freelance writing that she found her strong. She worked in public relations at Tri-C. It, it was as the co-editor of the Fairmont Temple Bulletin that I first came to know her. She not only wrote generously about my arrival in Cleveland, the first cantor at Fairmont Temple and first woman cantor in the state of Ohio, for both our bulletin and the Cleveland Jewish News. I still find newspaper clippings in our members' files that Gloria found in the Jewish News or the Plain Dealer or that she wrote herself. Whenever I find one of these articles, it is a gift of information with her astute insights and sensibilities all over it. In addition to editing the bulletin, Gloria wrote press releases, publicized our programs, and secured coverage in the local media for any number of our program speakers' initiatives. She was a pro. While we have considered many facets of the who, what, when, and where of her life story, the why is somewhat more elusive until we consider what I would identify as the anim animating passion of her life outside of her family. Gloria was, at heart, a writer who was energized by stories, human stories that begged to be told. 
She'd love to find stories, to unravel all of the threads of a story, and then to tell it to the reading public so that they would enjoy, learn from, be fascinated by, or repelled from it, but to have the experience of knowing it, and perhaps even growing from it. She understood the power of a good story, and she was relentless in her pursuit of good material. She used every contact, followed every lead, kept an eye on local news coverage, Jewish organizations and their programming. She enlisted Bob to consider his co-workers, industry contacts, and friends. She mined their bridge group, her friends and co-workers, family and community activists. She was endlessly creative, imaginative, and indefatigable. She found leads under rocks and behind closed doors. Somehow, she always had an idea or an angle, and once she settled on a subject, the reward was in bringing the story to the printed page to see her work bring reality to something that didn't really exist before she uplifted it and breathed life into it. That was her great gift and her wisdom in knowing how to touch the heart and soul and mind of her reader. That was her why. It kept her curious, always interested in new ideas and on her toes. Dan had the experience of working as her photographer for an article about Habitat for Humanity and another about the Cedar Center Hardware Store's owner Glenn's collection of license plates. He also observed Gloria's photographic eye, which was quite good and which she worked to improve through classes in photography. It was always a thrill to see her byline for an article quoted in the secular media. Over the years, she tackled stories in all walks of life and all corners of our community. Investigati investigative reporter that she was, she managed to secure interviews with nationally syndicated advice columnist Ann Landers and First Lady Rosalind Carter. She had guts, determination, perseverance, and connections. Among her many what's were her jello mold from a secret family recipe, her talent in knitting, and her letters to the editor, where she clearly and forthrightly expressed her opinion. She was a lifelong learner who took advantage of the offerings at the Cleveland College of Jewish Studies and the courses for seniors at Case Western. It seems that there were few things in this world that could bring a bigger smile to her face than the joy of eating out, with the possible exception of the most beloved who's in her story, Robert and the treasures of their married life, Laura and Steve. She wasn't exactly a June Cleaver mom, but, uh, uh, leave it to beaver fame. Although she did make a good cherry pop, and later a pumpkin and lemon meringue. She was always available to help her children with their schoolwork, and clearly had I high expectations for them, both in terms of their studies and their behavior. She was a great model in her own love of learning and reading, her activism, involvement, drive, willingness to take risks, and her tenacity in following a lead to wherever it might take her. Gloria was a sm somewhat formidable presence, a different kind of mother, before mothers started to redefine themselves. In addition to all of her talents, she was beautiful, Miss America beautiful, with a smile that lit up her face, because she didn't just smile with her mouth, she smiled with her eyes. I think that was another Dan observation, if I'm not mistaken. They were on a double date with other people when he first saw that smile and that beauty. It took him a few weeks to follow up because he thought she was in a relationship and gentleman that he was, he would not interfere. When he learned that she wasn't, he called and they went out on a date. As Robert said, 
they dated ever since. She was the mo more outgoing, talkative partner. Again, as Robert described, she kept things interesting. For 72 years, she kept things interesting as they walked side by side, hand in hand, as partners, lovers, companions, friends. They loved to travel on cruises to the Caribbean where Gloria photographed the other passengers to Israel, Europe, Hawaii, Alaska, and much of this country. They enjoyed each other's friends and developed a kind of matchmaking service that turned many of their friends into couples. They hosted family cookouts and barbecues at their house on Campus Road, where they lived for 65 years. It was the house in which Laura and Steve grew up, and to which they brought Dan Zuckerman and Ellen to be joyfully and fully welcomed as a true son and true daughter in their family. Gloria, with Robert, could not have been prouder of her children or their spouses, or loved them more, with the possible exception of grandchild Jeffrey, whose arrival into their world and into their hearts was a life's thrill. Gloria knew better than anyone that a, that a good human interest story lives far beyond its day in print. If the who, what, when, where, and why are carefully crafted and movingly told, if the protagonists affect us and evoke our interest, concern, and compassion, if their story touches our souls and inspires us to be better, to walk taller, to try harder, and to retell their story over and over again, then that person and that story will live on in our hearts and minds and those who come after us for as long as we continue the telling. Zichon Ali Bracha. May the memory of Gloria Omer, writer, reader, byline, and protagonist be always for blessing. And let us say, It is a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A fearful thing to love, hope, dream, to be. To be an O oh, to lose, a thing for fools this, and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. It is a human thing, love, a holy thing to love what death has touched. I call now on Stephen to offer his reflections on behalf of the family. <coughs> yeah, always, always. That's not serious. That can stay Well, it's uh, nice and sunny out there. I apologize, it may be raining pretty soon up in, in this end of it. Um, when I started to think about my mother and knowing she was going to pass, you know, all sorts of stories come, all sorts of memories come up. Um, some of them mentioned by Cantor Sager when we had a chance to meet on Tuesday. Some from talking with my father, my sister, my brother-in-law. And they're so powerful, and I would like to give some of my memories, some of the hopefully a few humorous things in there, and uh, you know some of the things I would ask of you is uh, we want to hear stories too. We want to hear your stories of my mother. Uh, I know people many times are reluctant at a after a funeral or at a shiva, you know, they don't know what to say. They're afraid of saying something that others might, you know, find offensive. Please, I want the stories. They, they mean so much. They mean so much to us. My mother 
it's really a product of not only Cleveland, but really the Cleveland Jewish community. If you really look at it, you know, she didn't venture more than most of her life except for six months where my grandfather owned the theater in Akron, Ohio. Her whole life was within five to ten miles of where she grew up. You know, Sycamore, just in Cleveland Heights, Cleveland Heights High School. She went to Forest Stone Mather, uh, which is always part of Western Reserve. Uh, her first apartment, as I was measuring it, it's five, half a mile up the road here, uh, Eddington, Campus Road, not that far away, and all her jobs, you know. So everything about my mom was the Jewish community. It was all of her friends, or almost all of her friends, a very great testament to her, was they were friends from elementary school, from mm -hmm. junior high, high school. Most of her great friends were friends for 60, 70, 70 years. And it was a great testament to my mother. And also a good part of her life revolved around Fairmont. You know, lifetime member of first Euclid Avenue Temple, and then Fairmont Temple, and the, uh, Cantor touched on a couple of things that she, she did in her time at Fairmont. Very devoted, uh, very involved in the community. Um, Cantor took about two of my work stories, but I will mention that uh, when my mother went, first started doing the teaching assistant at uh, Roxboro. I would say her pay was probably about a penny an hour, you know, because she, nobody, and I mean nobody, spent the time that she spent grading those papers, commenting on those papers, providing the students feedback on those papers, and I can see her sitting in a chair in the living room. That was where she graded them all, and uh, it was a chair that they, it was a reading chair and they brought it over when they moved. The story about not being a waitress. Um, I always remember that story because for the rest of my life, when I'd be at work and some administrative assistant would say, do you want coffee, or do you want tea, or do you want a glass of water? <laughs> because they're, they're not a waitress, you know? And I would never, I would never have them do that. And my, that was from my mother. There was one time I was watching 2020 on the, the news, and they were talking about some gentleman who was a, actually he was associated I think with the university here, and he was committing fraud. And up on the screen came a story and a, a headline about, you know, this guy, and he is, I guess, pretty great, and byline, Glory Ulmer. And, uh, you know, I always said, you know, she was a human interest story writer. She wasn't an investigative journalist. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it was always funny. My mother, you know, very much into the English, and she always would come up with these words, or how do you pronounce F-O-R-T-E? And everybody would always pronounce it, you know, the way you would have as a musical term. And it would be eh, wrong. There's two pronunciations, depending, at least at the time, depending on whether it was a musical term or whether you were talking about somebody's strengths. She loved that kind of stuff. She can read grammar books. She can read the most boring stuff to anybody else. And uh, she was, uh, to her, it was very interesting. Uh, she was quite conservative uh, in certain outlooks. I mean, if I took her to where I work, which is a large international bank, and she saw how the people dress today at work, I think she would uh, be shocked, to say the, to say the least. Uh, you know, there are certain things she was very, very conservative about. One time she told me a story about, they called them janitors back in the day, and uh, she went and he asked her, what is your favorite music? And my mother said, patriotic. And I don't think that was exactly the answer he was expecting. Uh, but my mother loved the Battle Hymn of the Republic. That must have like, been her favorite favorite song and uh, music, piece of music. And uh, I, I always remember that song. You know, when I think about my mother outside of work, you know, always a mom, you know, it's a lifetime job. 
And whether you are five or 10 or 65, she was still your mother and you were like her little boy. There's always a part, I think, that they always see that little boy, that little child, no matter how old you are. And for me, even as an adult, when I had difficulties or things are going on, I knew I could always call my mother and my mother would always be a good sounding board. Mothers also can be embarrassing, whether they're uh, coming to your school or whether they're telling stories. And my mother, you know, whether, again, she told us when I was in my 50s and almost drive me nuts, but in deference to her, my mother, I'll tell it again. And that is when uh, my Aunt Amy and Uncle Myron had a dog at one time, I believe his name was Bozo. And my mother said, I went over there and I said, look, mommy, doggy has bare feet. And I heard that story, you know, up until my 60s, I think. And she just loved telling that story, you know, and I hated hearing it. But, uh, you know, that was my mother. Um, you know, when we were growing up, my father and I used to like watching football on t TV. Still, and we'd be screaming at the television set, you know, bad call, bad play or something. And my mother had said, they can't hear you. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's a guy thing, you know? So she, she never quite got that one. As the uh, cantor mentioned, not only her love of reading and history, she had a love of current events as well. She was, and I think my mother would find all of this social media just, you know, wasn't the way things were done. If you wrote an editorial, it was respectful and you weren't tearing down the other side, you were stating your case. And some of those conservative values, you know, we can use a lot more of. Um, you know, everyone growing up, everyone knew Gory Ulmer, you know, and Cork kind of kept you on the straight and narrow because, you know, you, you knew your mom would hear about it about five seconds later. So, uh, you know, she was, she was just someone with so many connections in the Jewish community. And you know, now when it comes full circle, and she was ill, and she uh, was losing her memory, it always came back to things like Madison on the lake, which was something she talked about all the time. Her sorority in high school, and they were all Jewish, you know, at the time, you know, uh, the skating parties, the thing, the weddings that the cantor mentioned, um, those were the things that she remembered. Those were the things she she really cherished. And I know it, sometimes with uh, elderly people, it's it's the things that were 30, 40, 50 years ago that are the things because their short-term memory is gone. That are things that they really speak about. So you know. We've gone through the journey, and she had a wonderful life, and I took a quote out of the movie, each of our lives touched so many others' lives, and when she's not around, she leaves an awful hole, and her life touched so many other lives. It might not be something you find in the history books, you're not going to read about it, but she had these core, really core values of uh, family work, support for her community, things that we certainly need a lot more of. Uh, and in my last conversation with her, you never know if she understood or not. I hope she did. But you talk to her about all the things that you wish you could have said up until that time and never did. And all the things that, you know, seem material, you know, are so small at the end of the day. They don't matter. You know, what, what does matter to me is, you know, I'm never going to hear her, I'm never going to pick up the phone, the finality. But I love you, Mom. I'll miss you, and you'll always be with me.
Thank you, Steve, for that moving tribute to a very special woman. Oh God, you give us loved ones and make them the strength of our life, the light of our eyes. They depart and leave us bereft on a lonely way. But you are the living fountain from which our healing flows. To you, the stricken look for comfort and the sorrow laden for consolation. Oh God, we see life as two windows that open on eternity. We see that love endures and the soul endures as you, O oh God, endure forever. We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is the dwelling place of your love and glory. Please rise. Spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Gloria El Amor, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let her find refuge in your eternal presence, and let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is her inheritance. May she rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. The dust returns to the earth as it was. The Spirit returns to God who gave it. It is only the house of the Spirit, which we now lay within the earth. The Spirit itself cannot die. Receive in mercy, O God, the soul of our departed Gloria Alma. Grant her that everlasting peace which you have prepared for us in the world to come. Though no human eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has grasped it, still it is our sure inheritance and our everlasting portion. O God, Help us to understand that grief and love go hand in hand. But the pain which loss inflicts is the measure of a love stronger than death. Though we cry in the anguish of our hearts, may we be like children who know that their parent is near and who cling unafraid to the trust at the end. In this spirit, O oh God, do we commit all that is precious to us to your keeping as we repeat the words, as we repeat now the words hallowed by generations of our people in the Kaddish praise. Yit Kadav, Yit Kadav, Shemei Rabba, Ba'alma, Ra'ach, Yidute, V'yamlich Ma'ote, V'chayei Ba'ol, V'yamei Ha'ol, V'chayei Da'ol, V'yisra'el, V'agala, V'yizman, Kari, V'yimru, Amin. Yehi Shemei Rabba, V'yamlich Lam <laughs> 
It is part of the tradition of our people to help to bury our departed with our very own hands. And for those for whom it would have meaning to place a symbolic shovel full of dirt upon the gravesite, I invite you to do so at this time. service with these words from our tradition. Lech tishilach echadunah. Go your way, for God has called you. Lech vadunah yiyah imach. Go your way, and may God be with you. V'halach lefanecha tzitkacha kavod adunah yaaschacha. May your righteousness go before you, and the glory of God receive you. And we say to the mourners, Hamakom yanachem etchem. V'tov sha'ar avilei tzion di Yerushalayim. May God console you with all who mourn in Zion and Jerusalem. And I know that the family now wishes to return to Wiggins, and those who want may certainly place a shovel full of dirt upon the gravesite. 